So I'm very honored to talk to you today about my work on aggression. And um, while this title is correct, I'm not afraid, at least not of studying angry men in the lab. <laughs> and uh, not even to trigger them and to give them the opportunity to express their aggression. And I believe this is necessary because violent perpetrators often like insight into the power and nature of their aggression. Um, and I think studying aggression in, in general is important because um, it's not only very, not, doesn't only have very uh, strong consequences for the perpetrator himself, but also for his environment, for the victims he creates, and for society as a whole. I want to start this presentation by presenting you to this man. His name is Ronald Janssen. He's a 40 year one old drawing teacher from Belgium. And a couple of months ago, he was convicted, lifelong stay in prison, for murdering at least four people, for rape and for torture. People in the environment were really shocked because they thought that Janssen was a rather social, outgoing person, as he kindly shows us in this picture as he's smiling. And court psychiatrists, however, thought differently. They labeled this man as a psychopath. And psychopathy is a diagnosis that basically consists out of two parts. On the one hand, there is the display of uh, many and versatile criminal acts. And on the other hand, there's a uh, the personality component of, for example, lacking emotions or guilt. And when Jansa was asked for his motive for committing these horrible crimes, he said, honestly, I don't really know. Sometimes I just seem to change into a predator. And this interesting case brings me to two topics I want to discuss with you today. First, perpetrators like Janssen appearing perfectly normal at first sight. And this is something that has puzzled me and fascinated me from the first moment that I interacted with inmates and uh, forensic patients in jails. And um, the other thing I want to present to you, to want to talk to you about today, are different types of aggression. Predatory aggression, where Janssen is referring to being one of it, and impulsive aggression being the opposed type. So I want to explain the difference between those two types of aggression and to talk about factors that predict these aggression types and ultimately how we can lower these aggression types. So let's first talk about the aspects of being healthy. Are forensic patients really that healthy as some of them can display themselves? And we studied this in many different, in many different ways. And the first way was the most simple, so we basically asked hundreds of patients themselves to fill in questionnaires, having them rate uh, which healthy and unhealthy thoughts that they recognized. And indeed, as we expected, they indicated a very high level of healthy thoughts, and even comparable to non-patient controls like you and I, which is, of course, quite strange if you think about the horrible things that they uh, did in the past. So at first sight, we thought, well, they must be lying or lacking insight. And so we decided to ask their therapists. And to our surprise, their therapist actually agreed that, yes, compared to at least other patient control groups, Forensic patients do tend, to, do, do tend to display quite often these, well, healthy thoughts or healthy aspects in themselves. But these were all studies that were done under neutral circumstances. So we wondered what would happen if we would trigger these patients. And we tried to do this by making the patients angry, because this, of course, is an emotion that they experience quite a lot of the time. So our answer was, do they always display these healthy aspects in themselves? Inducing anger can be done in the lab in many different ways. And we came up with three methods that we actually found to be very effective. And the first one was harassment. And in this condition, we just asked patients um, general knowledge questions. And we manipulated the outcome, which was quite frustrating already. And on top of that, we said things to them, like, you're not doing well or uh, you're performing much worse than other patients with your educational level. Or if you're not going to do your best, you're not receiving the financial compensation that we would normally give people that participate. So this is quite aggravating, as you can imagine, and it made people very angry indeed. A second effective method that we had was the ego threat condition. And in this condition, we let participants rate facial expressions of other people. And we told them that this was a task that measures emotional intelligence. And this emotional intelligence is very important for succeeding in life. 
And then we said, well, you score very, very low, much lower than other people with your educational level, and much more than you anticipated yourself. So this was considered, perceived to them as an ego threat. So again, angering, of course. A final um, anger induction method we had was an interview. And in this interview, we simply asked to um, let participants tell about something in the past that made them very angry. And they start to tell us about things like, um, I had a conflict with my neighbor about reconstructing a common wall. And by the interviewer uh, asking details about that specific event, and by being very, very empathically about it, patients start to relive that anger again. So this was also very effective. And we decided to continue with this, anger, with, this in, with this interview method, of course, obviously because of ethical reasons and also because it was safer as an experimental to do this interview as opposed to the other tasks. So we used this interview, we administered this interview to our participants, and before and after, we let them rate those healthy thoughts that I was talking about earlier. And what we saw, uh, to begin with, is that we replicated that healthy thoughts were indeed much very strong in patients uh, who were from forensic clinics. So that was nothing new to us. But then the second thing we found, interest interestingly, is that these healthy thoughts appear to completely diminish after being angered. So the complete answer to our forensic patients healthy should be sometimes. It depends on when you're looking for it and under which circumstances they are. So in fact, uh, Janssen nailed it when he said, sometimes I change it to a predator. It seems to be like a reactive pattern. So we can say that in forensic patients, a lot of them have a mask of sanity. And this can have important implications, for example, for assessment of diagnosis or for uh, deciding which patient to let go on leave or not. So this is what I wanted to tell you about the healthy aspects. The second theme is on the aggression types. And um, uh, it used to be so that researchers thought that aggression was a unitary concept, like aggression is aggression, but that didn't really seem to be the case. So there are very different motives why people engage in aggression and very different forms of expression. And predatory and impulsive aggression are two types of that. Um, Predatory aggression refers to a controlled type of aggression. And when people engage in this aggression type, they do this because they have a certain goal. They want to obtain, for example, power or money. So it's predetermined. Impulsive aggression, on the other hand, is the very opposite. So people react to something that they consider to be a threat. So it's very impulsive in that way, reactive. And in one of our studies, we found that these impulsive aggressors actually tend to mis misinterpret innocent situations as threatening. So there doesn't have to be even an objective threat, but they perceived many things as being threatening. For example, we let them uh, read a vignette like this. You're in a local club while you dance, a stranger bumps into you. And when we'd ask forensic patients why would that stranger do that, they would very often say, he's doing that to picking a fight. So they like create threats also in their environment that are not necessarily there. Um, the other thing that is specific about impulsive aggression is that, it's, that it comes with strong bodily reactions. And this is what you would normally expect, right? When we get angry, our heart rate goes up and your blood pressure goes up. So this is typical for the impulsive kind of aggression. Predatory on, uh, aggression, on the other hand, is uh, very opposite to that. Uh, and what happens is that it does not affect bodily activity. So for example, heart rate, and it just says stable. Mental focus, on the other hand, is very strong in predatory aggression. And this like, opposing pattern has been uh, shown in animal studies before, but we were, the we were the first ones to also show this uh, in humans. So in one of the studies, we again administered the anger induction interview that I told you before, about earlier. And we measured heart rate and mental focus. And we saw that heart rate just like, stayed the same. It didn't change in people that are high in predatory aggression, that is. And mental focus, on the other hand, on the other hand really increased. So in a way, predatory aggression can be compared to a cat sitting very still, well, except from his tail then, and uh, 
well, he's very um, strongly mentally focused on the spray that he wants to catch. So this is comparable to what can happen in humans. Impulsive aggression, on the other hand, can be compared to when you are petting a cat and he doesn't feel like it and he will scratch you back very impulsively. So this is about the different types of aggression and how to differentiate them. An important next question then, of course, is how can we predict which kind of people or under which circumstances would display these types of aggression? And um, let me start by saying that there are many different causes for aggression. It's multi-causal, and we have to think about genetic, biological, psychological factor, but I will only point out two that, of course, uh, I studied most. And the first one appeared to be high narcissism. So uh, narcissism uh, refers to uh, being very self-focused and uh, thinking that oneself is much more important than other people are. And examples of people uh, that overly display their uh, narcissism are dictators like Hitler and Stalin. And we found that these overly displaying narcissists are very likely to be aggressive in reaction, so the impulsive aggression, but also to display predatory aggression to obtain money or power. So they can use it for both means. There are also the so-called like secret narcissists or covert narcissists that really don't display very openly that they think very highly of themselves, but underneath they do think that is the case. And we found that these covert narcissists are especially prone to displaying reactive aggression. So when triggered, they will strike back, but not really without a trigger. So taken together, narcissism predicts aggression, and this can be really problematic for the coming generation because uh, epidemiological studies have shown that uh, we can talk of a narcissistic epidemic among college students. The other thing that really appeared to uh, predict aggression is low self-control. And low self-control seems to work as a final gate waiter. So imagine that there are several triggers like um, very hot weather or being stuck in a traffic jam or whatever. Whenever it goes to the channel of high self-control and it's strong enough, you will not likely be aggressive. But when self-control is low, you will. And a longitudinal study actually showed that um, having low self-control at age three predicted having a criminal record at age 33. So low self-control appears to be a very important factor, not only for aggression, by the way, but also for health in general and for academic achievement. We found both high narcissism and low self-control to relate to self-reported aggression, to relate to high violent recidivism, so committing the violent crimes again and again. And also we found that these people uh, administered a very painful hot sauce to their opponents in our lab. We found them to administer very loud, annoying tones to opponents and to uh, be likely to give shocks to others. So if there's anything you might want to invest in while raising your children, let it be modesty and self-control. Um, a final question I want to address with you today shortly is how to lower aggression. Again, there are many different ways, and uh, I will not talk too much about this because me and my PhD students only recently started to work on this, but one of the things we're trying to do is to increase self-control, and it appears to be that you can do that until a certain degree quite simple by keeping um, glucose levels optimal or by training memory capacity. And uh, another thing we try to do is retrain thinking patterns by means of computer reaction time tasks, things like that. And together with my colleagues from neuropsychology, um, we are seeing whether transcranial magnetic stimulation, or TMS, would be able to lower aggression. And TMS is a method where you use a magnetic core, like in the picture, and you try to alter brain activity. So we're trying to find out whether um, interventions like that would help. Um, Hector Moles asked us to think about is the interdisciplinary aspects of our research, and so I did. And I think aggression um, is related to evolution uh, theory, because it used to be so that aggression was actually very effective for our ancestors to use to obtain their sources. Whereas since the 18th century, it virtually has 
outlived that promise and nowadays social coherence is more important. So aggression is definitely more problematic nowadays. Animal studies are important because these can learn us about um, the really extreme forms of aggression that are displayed, of course, without boundaries in animals. And being a multi-causal concept, we have to work together with psychologists, genetics, biologists, neuroscientists, and sociologists to you know, come up with a complete answer to that. And when we learn how to lower, ultimately, aggression, this can have important implication for the legal context, for politics, and also, uh, ultimately, to improve societal safety. This is uh, what I wanted to tell you today. Thank you very much, uh, Jill. Are there any modest questions, please? Or remarks on aggression? Some experience over there. Uh, Sylvia Heenman, Faculty of Health Medicine and Life Sciences. Uh, thank you very much, very interesting. I was kind of triggered by your title, uh, I'm not afraid of angry men. Um, should I be afraid of angry women? Is there a difference? When you s do you have female subject as well? Uh, yes, well I have to say that the title, um, the person that did the interview with me um, came up with this title because she thinks that I'm not afraid of men because I do this, of course, in the lab. But I basically think that you should really be afraid of men, of angry men. And then we talk about the relationship, of course, between anger and aggression because it's not always the same. It's not, there's nothing wrong with being angry, of course, but it's some factors that predispose some people to not being able to control that anger that makes it aggress uh, yeah, makes it um, dangerous, that is. And so definitely be afraid of angry men and of angry women. Uh, yes, I think so too. Um, the kind of uh, aggression that they displayed is typically quite different. And um, they use, normally they say that um, there are not that many uh, female psychopaths or antisocial patients, but it also has to do with the way um, the criteria are defined because many types of female aggression are not captured very well in the standard diagnostic instruments. So that's one thing people should look at more. And, um, but I have to admit, usually um, in the studies that I do, I mostly study um, men because uh, we think that it's quite a different pattern within females and we just need like double the amount of participants to be able to say something about that. So, for now, I focus on, on men, but women um, is definitely one of the next steps. Yeah. Over here. To follow up on this question about gender differences, mm -hmm. so you're focusing on men, but are you also um, uh, measuring uh, in, in markers, biological markers for aggression, like testosterone levels in those men, uh, stress hormones, cortisol, and so on? Yeah. Is there a physiological explanation for the observations you are making? Yeah. That's my question. Uh, thank you for the interesting question. It, it, that's definitely the case. That is what I refer to by aggression being a multi-causal concept. And definitely um, genetic and also biological factors interfere. And we did some studies where we uh, assessed testosterone and also cortisol. And we also were very interested in how these levels would uh, react when people were angered, whether that would change. And, uh, but the results, I'm still like, quite confused about them at the moment because we especially found uh, high reactive testosterone being specific of narcissistic men and not that specifically of patients that display a certain type of aggression. So it seems to have some kind of role. And uh, one thing that I would also predict and I'm studying at the moment, for example, is that people that are uh, high in psychopathy would have lower cortisol levels because it has more to do with stress reactivity and we presume them to have less stress than other types of perpetrators. But I'm, I'm not sure about how that would end up. But yes, it's an important factor. Yes, please. Uh, hello, Ellen Cook from uh, FHML. Uh, I have a question. A couple of years ago, I studied uh, uncomparable topo topic in um, young de delinquents, adolescents, and then there was a discussion about also about the two types of uh, aggression. You can either have impulsive or predatory uh, people with predatory aggression, um, or you can have people with 
both predatory aggression and only impulsive aggression. Yes. So this uh, discussion was, do you have only one of the types of aggression or do you have either impulsive or both of the uh, discussion? What do you think about that? Yeah. Really good question because uh, there has been quite some debate about it. They used to think that perpetrators are either impulsively aggress aggressive or predatory aggressive. And they try to put people in one of those you know, boxes, but that didn't really seem to work. And I definitely agree with them that this is not a dichotomous uh, concept, but that we should consider it as being two uh, separate dimensions. And people can just score medium high or whatever on, on one dimension. and the scores can vary equally on the other dimensions. And you even see that within one and the same criminal act, it can be so that there is, um, that a perpetrator displays both impulsive and predatory traits. And uh, for example, somebody uh, wants to, uh, let, let's say they want to rob a bank or something for some kind of obviously predatory reasons, but at that moment that the person is in the bank, somebody, uh, of the co someone of the customers insults that person and it's an, ex an extra trigger for them and they become even more aggressive but in an impulsive way. So I definitely think these are two separate dimensions and I might have said something in between that gave you the impression that these are two distinct things but this is just for means of simplicity. They are definitely uh, different. It's also quite complicated for research because um, there's a high intercorrelation between two types of aggression and so it's, it's a conceptual um, difficulty, but it's reality. Jill, how sure can you be in predicting, let's say, aggression-related recidivism? Is it 20%, 40, 100? Uh, uh, that's a very difficult question. I, yeah. I don't have an answer uh, to that. I think that... Um, um, well, it used to be so that people that try to predict aggression mostly use static factors to predict, predict aggression, like previous committed violent behavior or psychopathy. And these are really set things that you cannot change. And I think this is not sufficient at all, and that we should ask, that we should add dynamic uh, factors like anger, reactivity, and things like that. But even when you take those two together, I am not sure, and I think the field is not mature enough to say anything about the amount of explained variance or, or how well that it would predict aggression. I, I hope maybe in like 20 years or something I could answer this question. But. Okay, then I'll ask again. Yes. <laughs> yes, Sophia. Hanneke van Meer, faculty of psychology and neuroscience. I was wondering, you showed the changes in the patients after the interview mm -hmm. and um, what do normal subjects show? Do they show any changes at all? Or I guess lesser, yeah. but can you elaborate on that? Yes, 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 I'd love to. Um, uh, the thing is that regarding uh, healthy thoughts, for example, that didn't really change in healthy participants. So that was strong in the beginning and it stayed strong. So it seems to be that that's, that's much more stable. Uh, the other thing that uh, we observe in healthy people is that um, mostly uh, bodily reactivity did increase. So they did show increased heart rate and blood pressure and skin conductance and frowning and um, uh, elements like that after being angered. And um, regarding the mental focus, we found that to increase, but not as steep as it did with our forensic uh, subgroup. Yes. Yeah, 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 it's okay. <laughs> I'm going to take a shortcut, maybe. Uh, we have a lot of patients in TBS clinics. Do you believe eventually that uh, psychopaths can be cured? <laughs> oh, another very <laughs> challenging question, a big question also, but an important one, I agree with you. And um, whether they can be cured, um, uh, well, what is cured? Um, I think that we can come up with means to better be able to predict what, what people to keep inside the DBS and what people to let out. Oh, even that is still a very tricky question because we are studying all these uh, predictors on group level, of course, and it's always very difficult to determine for one specific person. And we don't always have insight also in, in the different 
things that are going on that might predispose a person to becoming aggressive. So, uh, but cure, uh, yeah, I'm not that optimistic. <laughs> yes, over there, please. Hans Auerstoff from uh, Maastricht University office. Uh, you told us to teach our children uh, modesty. Um, but then I was wondering, uh, some kind of assertiveness in, the, in, in people is quite healthy, they say. Uh, yes. And then um, that made me wonder, is, is assertiveness related to the concept of aggressiveness, of aggression, or are these different concepts? Because when they are related, you have to find the balance somehow. Yes, yes. Um, Yes, I really like this question a bit because it's about the dimensionality of when traits become toxic and when not. And that's certainly also the case with narcissism. Uh, for example, when you're very young as a child until like around age five or six, it's very healthy that you think that the world evolves around yourself. And then when you grow older, um, I think it should grow out of you a little bit, of course, but it's still... Um, very good to have the basics of self-assurance and of being certain, as you call it. And um, I think that having very low self-esteem, people used to think that that was a predisposing factor to aggression too. And they actually found that in various studies, but then 20 years later or so, they, came up, they decided that it's not really about self-esteem, because that doesn't really predict to one being aggressive or not, but it's really the narcissism. And the narcissism differs from self-esteem in that it's, it's more maladaptive, so they really think that everybody should follow me because I'm so great and the other people are really not that important. So they really like the social compassion uh, and an insight into the hierarchy and how that really is. Yeah. I had a similar question. I have uh, young children and as yeah, I'm a parent, I sometimes get angry with them, but <laughs> <laughs> how, how should I react or how should I l teach them self-control? Yes, um, yes, I, 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 I realize that I just say that as though it's very easy to teach them self-control and uh, um, <laughs> let me think very hard. Uh, so, self-control is mostly about um, knowing that you have certain needs and impulsive, impulses, but that you are able to tone them down in the end because they might have negative consequences. And so I think if people do something that is not accepted by you or by the environment or that can bring them into trouble, then people should be... Um, uh, no, then, then, then young people should be told that th they are crossing the line and so they should really uh, like know that some things you just cannot do in society and if you know that, then you're much more inclined to actually actively try to hire your self-control because you then understand how important it is to have that kind of trait. So that might be one, tra one way to go. Good Come luck. back within 20 years. Yes, also. <laughs> and bring your daughter. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we'll go visit her yeah. at TBS. <laughs> I can imagine that you have developed a very keen eye for uh, predatory aggression. And I was wondering, in, uh, do you see it in our political leaders, for example? And can you give us <laughs> voting <laughs> advice uh, about, uh, <laughs> about them? You just mentioned political leaders. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> well, um, Berlusconi is obviously, is obviously somebody who really displays that quite often or quite overt, uh, talking about the overt type of narcissism. So that's a, a famous example, I think. And um, I'm really interested in those type of um, narcissists and also in those type of psychopaths that um, they maybe don't always uh, show the typical kind of uh, aggressive acts, but um, more like the more indirect forms of aggression. And we call those people the white collar psychopaths. And um, it appears to be the case, I just read it, that, um, sure. <laughs> that um, among the highest levels of all types of hierarchy, uh, there are many of them. 
and I actually did several attempts to try to study them. This is on quality of life, isn't it? Yes, yes, it is. It can improve our quality of sure. life. And, uh, but it's difficult to, um, to grasp them uh, to start with because diagnostic instruments are not really good to, to tackle these kind of more like subtle uh, ways of uh, being aggressive towards other people and also because they are not always willing to participate, of course. And so we did a study among um, managers and uh, I, I, it, our hypothesis didn't really work out or that we would find some high psychopathic traits in them too or especially like the personality factors of psychopathy. And this was basically because I think that the more kind managers uh, said, oh yes, I will participate in your little study. And so it's difficult to try to, uh, to capture them. Okay, time is up. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> but it's one Ladies of my wishes. Ladies and gentlemen, wishes. just on the style. Thank you.